to this beautiful form of modern architecture in Singapore. This is the Marina Sands Bay Hotel, one of the greatest forms of modern architecture in Singapore. Huge three towers, and at the top of this is a beautiful swimming pool, an infinity swimming pool. Okay? And to build these great three towers, illustrated the analogy I'm going to be making, took some world-class infrastructure. This just can't be done on shaking sand. This has to be done with world-class infrastructure that's going to last for years and years to come. And as many of you know, Singapore is a bunch of islands. And once you've got that infrastructure in place, you can get to the top of this building, and you've got the view of the world. If any of you get to Singapore, you should swim at the top of the swimming pool. It's beautiful. You're out there looking out, and it's, it's fantastic. This is the same way in which we think about the way in which these three towers and end-user computing have to be built. Desktop, mobile, and content have to be best of breed. They've got to be strong in their own capabilities, but they then have to tie into world-class infrastructure, infrastructure that's specific for end-user computing. So there's a set of workspace services that include identity, catalog services, gateway services, social computing services, nicely embedded in that tie many of those three pillars together, but then in turn, also infrastructure that ties to the software data center. Because you know, if you talk to the end user computing bigots, they say it's all about end user experience. If you talk to the data center bigots, you'll say it's all about infrastructure. When you can bring those together, there's magic. And that's what we are doing at VMware to pull this together. Let me cover very quickly in each of those areas, in each of those pillars, why we believe today we have leapfrogged and are best of read. Because there's no combination or integration or view at the top of the pool that's worth having if each of those pillars are not strong. First off, in the desktop area, for the first time in the industry, when we launched Horizon 6 in April, we brought together virtual desktops and app delivery in one unified platform. Never been done in the, platform, in the industry before. These were two separate products from our competition. We've now got a unified architecture. And the reason architectures matter is that once you've got a beautiful next generation architecture, you can do things much faster. Customers tell us we are innovating in the last 15 months faster than some of our competitors have been in the last 15 years. That's what you get with a beautiful architecture. Secondly, we said, listen, cloud computing and the mobile cloud era is here. And it should influence even the world of desktops and laptops. So let's just be the first to draw desktop as a service. We acquired the company that had coined the term desktop as a service, Deathstone, and then actually brought that now on our vCloud Air architecture at an incredible price, two or three x the functionality of nearest competitors. And now today, we're also launching applications as a service, extending this to many different countries, even in Europe. So this is where we expect mobile cloud to influence even the desktop. What, we didn't stop there. We then said, listen, this whole area of the way in which you bring the virtual and the physical has never been kind of pioneered together. So let's actually make the delivery of applications really real time. And you're going to see that today. It's breakthrough technology with this neat acquisition that we have did. And, and for the new team joining us from Cloud Volumes, I'm going to warmly welcome you. You should meet these guys. They have built one of the best solutions for real time app delivery. And then finally, many of you said, listen, we want to have the richness of user experience in thin client computing fashion, rich 3D graphics uh, delivered in any kind of mobile cloud era. So let's go to some of the people who do this the best. And we went and partnered with NVIDIA and Google. And I'm happy here to announce a seminal partnership between the three of us. Let's launch the video. I'm super excited with the partnership between Google, VMware, and NVIDIA. With VMware, we're integrating the NVIDIA Grid virtual GPU platform 
with the world's leading enterprise virtualization platform. With this partnership, we're able to now provide applications that run on powerful workstations and PCs in the data center, and we can stream it and offer it virtually to any customer on any device. Over the last year, we've been working closely with Google to integrate and to create a fundamentally new Chromebook. With the next update to a Chromebook running the new NVIDIA process, customers using VMware vSphere and VMware Horizon desktop solutions will be able to deliver any application, even the most demanding 3D design or engineering applications, to a Chromebook. The work that we have done together is truly milestone work. We've revolutionized the way that designers can work, and we've redefined the future of enterprise desktop. Yeah. You know, I, Isaac Newton said, I often see clearly because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And for us, the shoulders of many of those giants are here in the room, customers and partners. You talk to us. But also when we get great brand, name, brand names like Google and Video to really push us together to optimize this, to run potentially even on tier one hypervisors, never been done before, uh, this is the type of experience we want to bring to you. The second core pillar. We cover desktop and laptops as the world of mobile and devices and machines. And we're just excited. AirWatch was announced earlier in January this year. We introduced it at PEX, but for many of you at VMworld, this is the first time you're seeing mobility. When I joined at VMware, the number one thing, many of you came and talked to me, was said, listen, fix your mobility strategy, and we have. We listen to you. We bought the leader in this space. Many of you, like Medtronic yesterday, already own this solution. 13,000 customers, AirWatch, the leader in mobile management security. And this is much more than a device management solution. It's got an application management capability, content management, email management, a full platform. We're investing 3x the amount of R&D than any of our nearest competitors, all on top of a multi-tenant platform. It can run in the cloud, on vCloud Air, uh, or also on premise. This is a great, great solution. But again, it's nothing if you can't actually drive management security in the context of applications. So we decided to go and partner with the leader in the applications industry, and a company I'm certainly very familiar with, SAP. So it gives me great pleasure to bring on stage Kevin Itchaprani, the Senior Vice President of Business Development and Strategic Ecosystems from SAP. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Kevin's great to have you here, and thank you for joining us on VMworld in front of 22,000 plus friends. How many of you are SAP customers? You got 40, 50 percent here right. raising their hands. Great okay, good. It. So tell us a little bit about what's new at SAP. So SAP, it's been an exciting journey over the last five years. We embarked upon a mission to double our addressable market, and since that time, not only have we become maintained the business leadership and applications, but we're also the number one in analytics, the number one in mobility, fastest growing database company, and number two in the cloud. And from a mobility perspective, we're finding that mobility is just fundamentally pervasive in the SAP customer base. We have customers now wanting to run mission critical applications, leveraging a phone, leveraging a tablet, even a wearable. So we've delivered a comprehensive set of solutions in mobile from 300 plus business applications, mobile security to manage, and a mobile application platform that allows developers to build rich enterprise applications that are device independent and OS independent. That's awesome, Kevin. So let's talk a little bit about our partnership. It obviously has different facets. We announced one earlier at Sapphire. Uh, so tell us about what we're doing together as companies and how it's segued into something we're doing here in mobile. Absolutely. This builds on a very long-standing partnership between SAP and VMware, which started four years ago when we started to work closely together to virtualize ERP applications and lower the TCO for mutual customers. We then recently announced at Sapphire Now, our conference two months ago, virtualization of HANA, our in-memory platform that now has 3,500 customers. And the new leg of the journey here, we're now bridging together and integrating our mobility offerings. And the beautiful thing here is we've taken mobile places, which think of it as our internal app store where customers can search and discover solutions, and we've opened up the APIs so we can seamlessly integrate with VMware AirWatch for those customers that have made that investment and seamlessly manage SAP applications. We're excited about this, Kevin, because it brings the, 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 all the best of breed capabilities that SAP has with management of applications and platforms with the best of breed capabilities of AirWatch and mobile security. So what's the benefit, if you would, 
uh, for customers and partners? What should they feel excited about as they look at what we could do together? Absolutely. The benefit for customers is with pre-integrated solutions, you get a lower TCO and faster time of implementation. And that's ultimately what our joint customers are looking at. Many customers have made investments in VMware AirWatch and SAP applications, and we can now allow them to seamlessly manage these applications, secure them, provision them to the device in a manner that is compliant for the corporate enterprise. But I would say, Sanjay, the most exciting part about this alliance is together two market leaders in mobility have come together, and I really believe that together we can accelerate the adoption of mobility in the enterprise. We're excited to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up Thank for you Kevin. So much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. So as you can see, we continue to sit on the shoulders and partner with giants to make sure that you can use our solutions uh, where you've got existing investments. The third pillar is content collaboration. And this is important because once you've got your desktops and your laptops and your mobile devices, probably the most important thing you want to do is share content. And we want to make sure this is simple and secure, that there's both control and there's choice. It shouldn't be an or, it should be an and. And here, for example, we want to ensure that you can access this anywhere, anytime, on a desktop, on a laptop, on a mobile device. It shouldn't be only a public cloud solution. Many of the European customers are averse to potentially a public cloud solution. Might we want something that's hybrid? It needs to have enterprise-grade security. It needs to have a key authentication scheme, digital rights management, all the types of things that allows you to ensure that those documents are secure. And then we're not thinking that we're going to be the only store of documents. There, it could be in SharePoint. It could be in OneDrive. It could be in Google Drive. It could be on iCloud. You need some kind of federated system that can sit on ten, top of any of that type of stores. That's exactly what we've done with our content collaboration, file sync, and share solution. So as you think about this, we're just excited again, to partner with leading companies. And if you go to the Apple website, you will see on Apple one of the leading case studies that they talk about of the use of iPads and iPhones is United Airlines. United Airlines is transforming themselves through mobility and the way in which they distribute content. If you walk to the airports, you see these you know, pilots carrying around the 30, 40 pound bags, which have got all the flight manuals for the landing instructions and all the airplane information. That's now being digitized in, all, in iPads. It's not just going to help the cockpit be more efficient. The next are flight attendants, so they can serve you better on an iPad, your favorite meal. All of this is happening now in airline after airline. United Airlines was one of the first to do this, transformed through the use of Apple technology, iPhones and iPads, but also AirWatch now for mobile security and content uh, collaboration. So we're very excited about this type of capability. Now, all of this comes together in an integrated solution. Remember, best of breed and integrated. So we spend a lot of time actually integrating many of the pieces. Kit Colbert, who's going to be up here in a second, has written an uh, uh, elaborate blog about all the different places. We've got seven streams. Here's two or three of them. There's integration between desktop and laptop, between mobile and content, not just with the workspace services, so you have a things like single sign-on, but also for the software-defined data center. Let me give you one example. If you think about VDI, one of the biggest costs of them is the way in which you effectively use storage. When you use our Horizon View products on top of virtual SAN, we believe we can take that cost down by 30 to 40%. A unique advantage of bringing together sort of the head and the body, or that big tall structure with the foundation. That's the type of advantage we bring to our customers. We also announced yesterday, and uh, Pat alluded to this, the notion of this new suite, the workspace suite. And think of this as the analog of the vCloud suite. If you knew the vCloud suite in the world of the software-defined data center, you now have the workspace suite for end-user computing. It takes those three pillars, ties it with some of the underlying glue called the workspace portal, and we have for you now the workspace suite, which we're excited to launch. Now, pulling this all together is just a huge amount of work, but we've been just grateful to get all of your support and the type of testimonials now that are showing up on the, among the customer and analysts have shown us clearly as number one in product and capability. And we've also been gaining enormous amount of market share. In the desktop area, we've now leapfrogged the competition. We're number one. In the mobile area, AirWatch was already one. But in the last eight months, they've gone further ahead in being number one in this area, top right. So we're very, very excited about this. So to actually show you some of this in person, I thought it would be great to bring on one of the key people on my team 
who's been driving a lot of this techno technology architecture, Kit Colbert, end user computing CTO. Welcome, Kit. Great, Kit. Great to have you. You're obviously a VMware veteran, well known here, 10 plus years. You were the star last year. Uh, now you're obviously in this new role. Tell us a little bit about what's going on and how you're driving the architecture and perhaps even show us some of this in action. Sure, well, you're too kind. But uh, So you've been talking a lot about this mobile cloud era and how it's changing the landscape of end user computing. But from a technology standpoint, we have to think about how we redefine an architecture that meets all the requirements of this new era. And so specifically what we're thinking about is this mobile cloud architecture. Now in this architecture, apps, data, policy, that all lives in the cloud. And devices are essentially stateless. They can connect into that cloud, and they light up and personalize for their end users. So this is great for IT, because it means it's simplifi simplifying management. They can manage everything in one place and get very consistent management across all devices. It's also easy for end users, because they can connect the device of their choice up to the cloud and get a consistent experience across whichever device they choose. So what I'd like to do now is dive into each of those use cases, end users and let's IT, and talk a little bit more about how that works. So let's start with end users. And what we want to do here is give you just a really concrete example of how this technology is, is shaping the landscape of these industries. And so the one particular industry we wanted to focus on was healthcare. We couldn't think of a better example. I mean, talk about an industry that's shaped by technology, and yet at the same time isn't about technology. It's about, it's about people. It's about ca caring for people. So in this example, what I wanted to do was kind of give you a day in the life of a doctor at a hospital. So I'll play a doctor, and Sanjay, we'll make your mother proud. You're a fashionable-looking doctor kit with those designer shirts, and I've always wanted to be a doctor, so my mom will be proud today. Right. Yeah, I can't wear the lab coat. I've got to look good. Right. So, OK. Uh, so yeah, so what I want to do is just give a simple day in the life, right? a few different vignettes of how I go through my day as a doctor at a hospital. And Sanjay, you'll be a doctor as well. All right, Dr. Dr. Colbert and Dr. Poonin in action. So I'm at City Hospital today. Let's jump into the demo. So the first thing I do, I get into the office, get, grab my cup of coffee, sit down at my desk, log into my Mac. Now, as a doctor who moves between multiple hospitals, a big problem for me is actually being able to get access to all the apps and data for the current hospital that I'm at. VMware Workspace Portal makes this very easy for me by giving me one place to go to get access to everything and to get one-click access to it all. That's a really important piece. Not only that, I can actually drill in here and self-service add additional applications. So we can see here that I can add some EMR apps, which gives me access to patient medical records while I'm on the go. So that's great. So I can get started working. And, oh, looks like I just got a call. Looks like a patient needs to see me. So I will leave my desk, leave my Mac, grab my iPad, and walk toward the patient ward. Now, while I'm walking toward the patient ward, I, I check my iPad. It's managed by AirWatch, and it's also connected to City Hospital's data center. So the same set of apps that I just saw on my Mac are here on my iPad. This is really important for me as a doctor because it means I can quickly transition between devices but don't lose any of the experience. So here I'm accessing the SAP EMR app. I can get all this, this patient's vital medical records so I can refresh my memory on his case. So Kit, pause for a second. Room. You just walk from your office. You're on your run now, going to the wards. No separate login, the same sets of applications, and you have SAP EMR now brought up on the run. Pretty amazing. Right. The point is to make it easy for me as a doctor, right? So I can be ready to talk to that patient when I get in the room. Now, I'm in the room talking to the patient, and I realize I need to check another data point. So I can quickly turn around and badge into the thin client there in that uh, patient room. And so when I badge in, I get automatic access through VMware Horizon to a virtual desktop running high-resolution 3D medical imaging. Same sort of 3D stuff we saw in that really cool video a few minutes ago from Google and NVIDIA. The point here is that I don't need a high-end 3D workstation. I can use that, that thin client. I can use my iPad. I can even use my phone if I need to. The point is I can get access to this high-resolution 3D data from wherever I am while I'm on the go. This is a workstation now in the room of the, of the patient. Yeah, thin client or whatever it is that I have in front Great. of me. OK, so I can check out what's going on here. But you know, a lot of times I need to get the advice of a specialist. In this case, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Poonin. Love to get your advice on this case. Now, I can't just send Sanjay an email with this document in it, right? I've got to have security. I've got to have HIPAA compliance. And I need something better. I need something that has that built in. That's exactly what AirWatch Secure Content Locker offers. 
I, as a doctor, don't need to worry about those security and compliance issues because Secure Content Locker takes care of it for me. I can just focus on collaborating with other doctors and finding a resolution to this patient's issues. So here you can see I'm adding in Sanjay. I'm sharing that document with him. I'm just going to write him a quick note. Now, let's switch back to the slides real quick and check out what's happening on the back end here. Because again, unbeknownst to me, this is all transparent as a doctor, but be behind the scenes, a lot of things are happening. So here I am at my hospital, City Hospital. And what we see is that Sanjay is actually at a different hospital, University Hospital. I'm at Stanford University Hospital. Got right, it. Exactly. Okay. And so uh, what's happened here is that we have different security perimeters around these two hospitals, right? But what we're doing here is really taking Secure Content Locker and extending that security perimeter inside of Sanjay's hospital, specifically to his device, in this case, your iPad. Right? Okay. So now I'm able to log into my iPad at Stanford University. Right. So let's jump into that and see what your iPad looks like. Got the nice green looking screen, and I'd like to bring up my own content locker. Uh, and hopefully, the image that you've seen sent me, uh, I can actually bring up now an x-ray image, and I can collaborate around this. Uh, you've asked me to look at this, which I will. But you know, actually, kid, I'd actually like to hone in on that particular little white spot in the skull. I'd like to maybe annotate this, maybe sort of you know, cover this and write a short note to you to say maybe that's the area you've got to focus on. Well, thanks. That's helpful for me. And the, good, the cool point here is that we can collaborate and annotate in real time here. So we can actually work together, even though we're at different hospitals, in a very secure and HIPAA-compliant fashion to reach an agreement on what's happening with this patient. Perfect. All right. So that's great. So let's jump back to the slides. So again, I think those... people have gotten a little bit, uh, you know, enough of the skulls here. So <laughs> yeah. we enough of the medical back images. To perhaps right. showing how the IT people use this. Well, the point here was that as I went throughout my day, I used different devices. I was in different locations. But in the end, it was all about having more time to treat patients. And that's really what it's all about. And that's exactly how this mobile cloud architecture is empowering me as a doctor and as an end user. Now, it's not just about end users, right? That's a big piece of it. But IT is another big part of it as well. We have to be able to manage these systems. And the biggest challenge for IT today is simplification of management as all these devices proliferate and flood into the workplace. You've got to be able to manage at scale. So the first part about that is focusing on how you simplify application delivery. Well, the good news is that AirWash has already radically simplified app delivery on mobile devices. It's really easy for admins to entitle a user or a group of users to an app. It's just a point-and-click experience in an admin UI. They click a couple of buttons, and boom, that app just pops up on that user's device. It's really simple and, and, fr and frankly, foolproof, right? This is the exact same simplicity that we want to bring to the desktop side. And that's exactly why we acquired Cloud Volumes. So let's jump into a demo and check out what that looks like. OK, so again, I'm the IT guy. I'm the IT admin here. All right, you're CIO so, Kit Colbert now. Yep, so now I've got uh, my Mac here. I've loaded up your virtual desktop. And I notice here that you've downloaded a file. You tried to open it. Yeah, it's PowerPoint, but I can't open it. Yeah, no PowerPoint on, looks on that like I don't have Office virtual desktop. So let's switch over to the uh, Cloud Volumes admin UI. And we can entitle you to this uh, application, or the Office Suite, actually. Now, you'll notice that as we go through here, as we click, it looks very similar in concept to AirWatch, right? That same simplicity, the mobile experience of pointing and clicking to entitle Sanjay or an entire group of users to this app. Now, before we do the assignment, let's take a look and really make sure we watch that Windows desktop and specifically that cloud volume okay, you're icon. You can install Office for me on my desktop. Seems yeah, so the icon's blank right now because Windows, there's no app to handle it. But if we, when we hit Assign, what you'll see is that that application will be immediately delivered to that desktop, and the, app, and the wow. icon will update. There it goes. Is it really that fast? That was it, yep. And it could be to groups of users at the same time. Yep, it could be to you, to many people, it doesn't matter. Okay, the let's... point is that this is not streaming in the background or anything. Cloud Volumes is actually leveraging all the hypervisor innovations we've done in vSphere to optimize the delivery of that application so it's super lightweight and fast. Simple and easy. Now I can now open it up in PowerPoint. Yep. But you know what, Kit? That's like a simple scenario. I mean, I got you know, dozens, maybe hundreds of applications on my desktop. You're a power user. I know. Something. I'd like to think I am. OK. Well, you know what? Just as easily as we added the Office Suite, we can give you a lot of apps. How many apps do you want? You want a few hundred? Yeah, I don't know, 50, 100, somewhere okay. in there. What do you got? So we got this lots of applications. Wow, yeah, grouping. that looks a little Let's bit get, like Yeah, like... 215, 216. It's a lot of apps. So just as easily as we entitled you to the PowerPoint suite, which was, you know, it was 21 apps, and not just one. It's quite a few. We can do it here as well. Again, a couple of simple clicks. We make the assignment. And just as quickly as we delivered Office, we can give you all this insane amount of stuff here. OK, that looks more yeah. like my desktop. Does that look although, like, I mean? Although I need to clean it up a little bit, but that looks more like my desktop. OK. All right, I get it. I think this is, 
This is remarkable. I didn't think it could be that easy. It does look like a power user's desktop, Sanjay. So, all right. <laughs> so that's great, right? So we've simplified application delivery for desktop. But the point is that we also need to think about how we simplify desktop delivery itself. And the reality is that when you think about desktop delivery today, it's quite a cumbersome and time-consuming process. It can take on the order of minutes to provision a virtual desktop. And if you're prov provisioning hundreds or thousands of these things, that can be very time-consuming, and really it's just not scalable, right? We need a better way. So just like cloud volumes leverage hypervisor innovation to optimize the delivery of applications, so we can do the same for desktops themselves. And as a matter of fact, Pat talked about this yesterday with Project Fargo. Project Fargo clones a running virtual machine to create an identical one in just a second or so. It's very fast. And so this is important for a couple of reasons. The first is that you get a new powered on virtual machine in about a second. And the second is that virtual machine, the new one at least, is extraordinarily lightweight because it shares all the memory and data with the original. So we have this process today that takes many minutes. And when you put it all together, leveraging Project Fargo, what we can now do is get that to just a couple of seconds to get you a new virtual desktop ready to go. That's a 30x speed improvement. Wow, that's incredible. It's really 30 times faster. Exactly. It's amazing, right? And so here's the crazy thing about it. We've taken something that used to be quite expensive and have now made it basically free. And any time you do that transition from expensive to free, it gives you tremendous opportunities to think about how you re-architect a system. And that's exactly the opportunity we're taking when thinking about the mobile cloud architecture for desktop. So let's take a look at how this works when we put it all together. So we start off, we have our vSphere systems running. We've got one virtual machine, a base Windows image. We call it the live template. Now, when a user logs in, what happens? They choose the device they want. They log in. We will use Project Fargo to clone that virtual machine, again, under a second, very fast. We then use cloud volumes to dynamically inject all that user's applications and data. So what we now have is a fully personalized virtual machine, virtual desktop for that user. But it's completely transparent to that user because it only took a couple of seconds, right? And then when that user logs out, we can destroy that desktop. Disposable, truly disposable. So the important part here is not the desktop. It's the mobile cloud architecture and the fact those apps and data live up in the cloud. The desktop itself is just a temporary vehicle for delivering apps and data to the end user, just like any device is in the mobile cloud architecture. This is extraordinarily important for a couple of reasons. The first is that it radically simplifies administration. No longer are you dealing with bits on a disk. Just like mo with mobility, it's now checkboxes in an admin UI. Those bits on a disk, they are dynamically reconstructed for you by the system when that user logs in. The second, you're going to see tremendous cost reduction through increased consolidation due to all the resource sharings we talked about with Project Fargo. And finally, it's just more secure. Whenever a user logs in, it's like they get a brand new desktop, all the apps, all the data, up to date, the latest patch level. And again, this is very, very much like mobility, where apps are consistently and constantly being updated so you're not left with any known vulnerabilities. So this is something we're working on internally, calling it Project Meteor. But you know, what we realized was that we're really defining kind of a new category for desktop here. And so it's something that we're calling just-in-time desktops. It's desktop reimagined and inspired by mobility. This is amazing, kid. I think this is just absolutely fascinating. So ladies and gentlemen, as we wrap this up, here are the three messages we want you to be able to, to take away. A unified experience now driven from this mobile cloud type of architecture reinvents everything, all devices desktop to laptops. Right, and customers are taking this and actually driving real change with it, as we saw with the healthcare example from earlier. All of this is possible with, with a world-class infrastructure. And being optimized for the software data center really makes this magic really happen. And speaking of the software-defined data center, it brings us great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Raghu Raghuram, the general manager of SDDC. Thank you very much. Have a good conference. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great job. Good morning. And thank you for participating in VMworld 2014. Over the last decade, you were team virtualization. Thanks to you, virtualization rapidly became mainstream. In the process, we created a new industry. We transformed an industry. And for many of you, you transformed your careers. Now, over the last year, you have enthusiastically adopted the software-defined data center architecture and technologies. 
thanks to you, STDC is on its way to rapidly becoming mainstream. You are now Team STDC. Now let's look at some examples of the momentum in the last year. We recently announced the beta of vSphere 6. The best hypervisor on the planet got even better. In the short few weeks that we have announced the beta, there have been over 10,000 downloads of vSphere 6 beta, showing your interest in the foundation for the STDC. Virtual SAM, we introduced it earlier in the first quarter. And in the first full quarter of sales, we have had over 300 customers using virtual SAN, and that number is increasing rapidly every day. Now let's talk about another example of momentum. Let's talk about networking. If you were here last year, you would have seen the buzz and the excitement around NSX. Before NSX came along, it was thought that you could not do networking in software. NSX changed all of that. And in just one short year, the largest banks, the largest telcos, indeed the largest enterprises in the world, are all deploying NSX to transform their network. That's amazing momentum. Last but not the least, management. Our cloud management platform has been recognized as the number one platform in the industry. The reason for all of this momentum is very simple. This is the only architecture, the STDC is the only architecture that can resolve the conflicts that Ben talked about. It is the architecture for today and tomorrow. It is the architecture that brings together traditional applications and cloud native applications. It is the architecture that allows IT to run the infrastructure and DevOps and developers to consume the infrastructure programmatically. It is the architecture that enables governance and control on the one hand, while enabling self-service and elasticity on the other hand. It is the architecture that you can deploy inside your data center. It is the same architecture that powers our vCloud Air service. In short, this architecture is the power of AND in action. So let's take a quick tour of the new developments in STDC, starting with the hardware layer, the fundamental building block. Ever since VMware started business, hardware choice has been a fundamental calling card of our strategy. Today, if you wanted to build an STDC, you can select hardware components from any number of our partners. In effect, you can become a systems integrator yourself. Some of our partners have introduced converged infrastructure, powerful engineered systems that combine server, storage, and network out of the factory, optimized for STDC. Yesterday, Pat announced the next evolution of infrastructure, hyper-converged infrastructure. Let me explain why this is hyper-converged infrastructure. So with the advent of vSphere, compute virtualization, NSX, network virtualization, and vSAN, storage, it is now possible to dramatically simplify the infrastructure underneath your STDC. For the first time, you can have a single building block, a standard building block, an x86 server with the right amount of memory and flash and magnetic disk, and completely construct your data center by using the standard building block. This dramatically simplifies the operating model for data centers. So you can start racking and stacking these 
building blocks, pour the STDC software on it, you're on your way to building an STDC. We call this VMware Evo. And to explain VMware Evo further, let me invite Ben back onto the stage. Thank you, Raghu. Hi, Ben. See you. Good to see you. Thanks. So let me ask you something, Raghu. Yeah? What, what do can you, want? you do in 15 minutes? Oh, get an insurance quote, maybe? From a lizard? <laughs> yes, indeed. I would get it from anybody. You talk to lizards but often? <laughs> if they buy STDC, I'll talk to them. All right. <laughs> so, what else? What else could you do? How about getting a haircut? I can get a haircut in 15 minutes. Yeah, I can get a haircut in one minute. But, oh, there uh, you go. <laughs> something I wish I wasn't so efficient then. at. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, 15 minutes is also the amount of time you need to get Evo Rail up and running and deploying oh. VMs. So let me show you how this works. The Evo Rail, the first member of the Evo family, is really designed to be deployed in under 15 minutes. It, it scales up to 100 VMs and 250 desktop VMs. That's powerful. And it also, with recent testing, we've seen it support up to 15,000 exchange mailboxes. 15,000 exchange yeah, mailboxes. That's three to four X higher box. than our competition. Wow. With one box. It also enables non-disruptive upgrades. So let me show you how all of this works. The design is really elegant. It's a 2U form factor rack mountable, mm -hmm. and it's built up of four identical and independent physical nodes. Each of these nodes is made up of compute, storage, and networking. And as you mentioned earlier, it uses virtual SAN. So you don't need an external SAN or NAS array. As I mentioned, it gives you zero downtime upgrade. What happens is, if you want to upgrade a node, it automatically vMotions the VMs onto the other nodes. You do the upgrade, and it automatically moves the VMs back. So there's zero impact to your applications running. Your users won't know that you're going through an upgrade cycle. You need more capacity? You can scale out. You can take up to four of these Evo Rail units and connect them together. And the Nodes discover each other automatically, so you get up to a 16-node cluster all working together with four times the capacity that I mentioned earlier. So it's really powerful. Let's take a look at the UI. It's really simplified. It web-based UI, and you literally can just hit go after you power it on and plug in the network. But you can also customize it. If you don't like the default settings, you can go in. You're presented with a very simple UI. You can change the host names, change the network settings, the passwords, the virtual SAN configuration, whatever you need. Once you've done that, you click a button. It validates your input to make sure everything's going to go OK. And if, if it, everything is OK, it goes through a fully automated process. It initializes the hardware. It initializes the software. It builds the virtual appliance that ne needs to run. It configures everything, and then finalizes it. Now, that process, that entire process from beginning to end, takes less than 15 minutes. Once you log in, you're also, again, presented with a web-based UI that's very simplified, and it allows you to deploy VMs, small, medium, large. Now, these configuration settings are changeable, of course. So this looks different than Virtual Center. Can we still use Virtual Center? Absolutely. This okay. is supposed to be a simplified UI. If you just want to do basic stuff, you can use this UI. But all of our management suite is available and can be used. It almost so, looks like a consumer appliance. Yeah, that's the idea. That's why we like the simplicity, and I think our customers will love it as well. Great. Right. But wait. So Evo Rail is now available as, uh, as of Q3, and you see a list of our partners here that are delivering it, and I'm sure there will be more of them in the future as well. This is awesome. But as Pat mentioned, Evo Rail is only the first member of the family. It util utilizes vSphere and Virtual SAN, and it also comes uh, pre-configured with Log Insight, so you can do log analytics. But if you need more than that, you probably want to use Evo Rack. Mm -hmm. Evo Rack is the second member of this family, and it comes pre-configured with the entire SDDC suite. You get the vCloud suite, you get Virtual SAN, you get NSX, and in addition, 
you get rack management software, and you get data center fabric management software. So today, that's top of rack switches. We program those. And in the future, we can also do spine and leaf. We're looking at doing that as well. You can start with a half a rack, and you can grow to multiple racks. And all of them are managed with the software. So it's really a great way of building your entire data center utilizing the SDDC architecture. The Evo rack architecture is built to go from the time you power it on to deploying applications in less than two hours. It's really powerful and fast, and the time to value is really excellent. It also goes to data center scale. As I mentioned, you can have multiple racks, and all of them will be configured using the same software. And it includes lifecycle management software as well, everything from rack management to network management to the standard infrastructure management that we have in our suite. You can see all of it in the Evo zone, uh, in the exhibition hall, and you should know that about 20% of the hands-on labs today at VMworld are being powered by Evo Rack. So it's real, it's running, and we're very proud of it. Since we are big on hardware choice, does it run on all types of hardware? This can run on all kinds of hardware. We've, as Pat mentioned yesterday, we're partnering with the Open Compute Project, and our Converge Infrastructure partners also are working with us to, to deliver on that hardware. So this is the Evo family. You know? And I'm sure there will be more members of it in the future as well. So. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. What's this? Wow. Really, Ben? What is this? I think this is about the power of and, better ah, together. You know, it. Batman and Robin. All right. Batman and Robin. I'll to save Evo Rail. All yeah, right. we got to go Gotham save City. Gotham City. All right, yeah. back to you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so you saw how we not only provide hardware choice, but we are providing a dramatic simplification of your data center infrastructure. But customers, you often tell us, hardware choice is great, but what about being locked in at the VMware layer? Pat addressed that question yesterday when he announced OpenStack on VMware. VMware integrated OpenStack, the OpenStack distribution from VMware now in beta. About 15 or more months ago, we joined the OpenStack community. Since then, we have been contributing code not only to the core compute and network and storage components of OpenStack, but in fact, all of OpenStack. We have put in a tremendous effort. In fact, we lead some of the new initiatives, such as the Congress Policy Initiative. As a result, I'm proud to say that the best way to run OpenStack is on top of VMware. Let me repeat. The best way to run OpenStack is on top of VMware. Because you've got an integrated OpenStack offering that's built right into vCenter. You can activate it with virtual appliances. And once you've done that, it takes advantage of the best hypervisor, the most trusted hypervisor on the planet. It takes advantage of the most innovative networking stack in the industry. It takes advantage of the hundreds of storage arrays that are supported by vSphere, including virtual SAN, and of course, including virtual volumes. But we don't stop there. Our vRealize management suite adds value on top of OpenStack as well, providing value where none exists in OpenStack today. We go above and beyond. To complete the story, this will be a fully supported offering from VMware. This is why we say this is the best way to run OpenStack if you want to run OpenStack. Now, if you happen to be using a distribution from somebody else, from one of our partners, perhaps the Helion distribution from HP, or Canonical's distribution, or the distribution from Mirantis or Suze, no problem. Those partners will also have their distributions work on top of the VMware stack. Wow, so you've got a choice of distribution. Excellent, excellent. Now here is the benefit to you. As an IT organization, 
you do not have to learn new tools. You do not have to learn new skills. You can continue to use your trusted infrastructure as is, and your developers and DevOps community can start consuming the infrastructure using the programmatic APIs provided by the OpenStack framework. And they can move their applications from other OpenStack frameworks onto this, or vice versa. This is the power of AN in action. What is this? I don't know. Is that Romeo well, and Juliet? <laughs> why do I have to be Juliet? At least you had more hair, that's why. Uh, OK, that's a fair deal. I'll, I'll live with it. <laughs> All right. You know, that story didn't end really well. Oh, this is going to be much better. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the next layer of the story, right? We looked at hardware choice. We looked at the cloud infrastructure layer. But the reason these exist is just for one reason and one reason only, and that is to power your applications, right? That's ultimately what the business expects out of us. And that is what all of this is about. If you think about the application landscape, Pat alluded to this yesterday, this is a time of great architectural change. You have your traditional applications built on the client-server principles. You have cloud-native applications built on a completely different and modern model. Traditional applications, however, form the majority of your data center and will continue to be so for a while. And what's more, more than 80% of these applications, on average, are running on top of the vSphere platform. So it is very important to us, and we spent a lot of R&D, innovation, and dollars, and time, and effort to enable us to continue to innovate to make vSphere the best platform for traditional applications. Now, let me give you two examples that you will find in the vSphere 6 beta, starting with fault tolerance. So many of you are aware of fault tolerance. It exists in vSphere today. But it is only restricted to applications that consume one virtual CPU. With vSphere 6 beta, we have expanded that to four virtual CPUs. So now, with four virtual CPUs, you can cover practically 90% of your application uh, real estate. For all of these applications, the fact that SMP FT is turned on will provide these applications with zero downtime recovery up to the second recovery instantaneously without any further application action or modification in the event of a hardware failure. You can right. turn this on using an API, or you can turn this on using the UI. This is powerful stuff. All right, finally. I've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> yes, yes. Good, th good things come to those who wait, Ben. <laughs> this is just one example. Now let's talk about another example, application mobility, what we know as vMotion. Over a decade ago, we broke the laws of physics when we created vMotion. Since then, we've been continuously innovating in this field. Then came storage vMotion, network vMotion, vMotion without shared storage. And now in vSphere 6 beta, you will see cross vCenter vMotion. Let me explain what that is. This is the ability to migrate an application from a rack of servers that is managed by one instance of vCenter to a rack of servers managed by another instance of vCenter. This is powerful because this allows you to relocate your applications to any part of the data center at any time for any reason. This allows you to load balance your data center, balance the capacity in your data center much better. But we haven't stopped there. We are not confined by the boundaries of the data center. With long distance vMotion, which is also part of vSphere 6, 
you can literally migrate an application coast to coast from one data center in the one corner of this country to another corner of this country. Now you add the magic of NSX to it, the network properties of these applications do not have to change at all. If they are living on the same overlay network that is now stretched between vCenters, whether they are in the data center or across the country, none of the network properties change, even though the underlying networks can be completely different. Wow, that's powerful. That's this, awesome. This is science fiction in action. Excellent. Excellent. It's another one I've been waiting for for a long time. <laughs> Somehow he turned into my chief heckling officer here. So, <laughs> um, chief support officer. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you. So the point is there is a whole set of new use cases around proactive disaster avoidance and data center migration that become possible with this technology. Now let's turn our attention to new applications or cloud-native applications. And to explain what we do for cloud-native applications, let me ask my chief application officer <laughs> to chime in. Thank you, Raghu. So, you know, you're right. You, you mentioned cloud-native applications are fundamentally architecturally different from traditional enterprise applications. Typically, they're built with what are called services or microservices. These are smaller than the traditional monolithic stacks that are built in enterprise applications. And this allows for fast iteration. Each of these services can be deployed, it can be upgraded, it can be managed independently of each other. And that's really powerful. And the services work together to deliver the entire application. Developers typically use containers for this. Now, containers are a new technology. They're not a new technology. They've been around for 10, 15 years. Um, they have been available in BSD as jails, yeah. in Solaris as zones. Even Windows 2000 Data Center Edition 15 years ago had a similar concept in it. So containers aren't that new. They're really powerful abstraction, but never, never really caught on until a couple of years ago. A company came along called Docker, and they've created this really nice, ubiquitous packaging format so developers can write their application once and run it anywhere. Literally, they can run it on their laptop, they can run it on a bare metal Linux server, they can run it in the cloud, they can run it on a PaaS layer, and that's the power of Docker. It's the ability to move your application anywhere without having to worry about the infrastructure it's running under. And in fact, some people are already saying, you know what, VMs are yesterday's news, Docker and containers are the future. We believe that's fundamentally wrong. We believe in containers without compromise, and what that means is we think VMs and containers deliver the best value when they work together. Our customers really don't care whether they're running inside their application inside a VM or they're running it inside a container or both. They really just want their application to run, and they want to be managing at the application level. Everything else underneath is irrelevant. So, um, if you think about it, those containers today, as I mentioned, a developer will probably work on it on their laptop. Mm -hmm. They'll maybe use Fusion or Workstation or just standard Linux to develop the application that allows them to do fast iterations. But at some point, they've got to take that application into production. Right. And when they put it into production, we believe the best place to run it is on top of VMs because that gives IT the ability to control the environment. And there's no need to set up another infrastructure silo so that you can just run your containerized applications. You can run them seamlessly the same way on the same SDDC architecture. And VMs and containers together give you the best value. Um, what you want is really to be, again, managing your applications. Why do I keep harping on that? Because we think it's wrong to try to manage every single VM, every single container. Mm -hmm. That would be the same as if you tried to manage every single process in your Linux laptop. Right. It just doesn't scale. When you are an enterprise, you have thousands of applications, you have tens of thousands of VMs, maybe hundreds of thousands of containers. You're not going to be managing every single one of those independently. That's why we're, we've started working with Google and Docker. Docker, I mentioned earlier, they've built this ubiquitous packaging format that's really great. Google, a couple of months ago, open sourced a project they call Kubernetes. 
I'm working What's on my strange name. Yeah, I'm working on my Greek and Latin. So Kubernetes apparently it means helmsman, and it's a management resource management tool for containers. But interestingly, it doesn't manage every single container. They introduced the concept of a pod. A pod is a collection of containers and or VMs that together build up a service or an application. And that's really the right level of abstraction for us to be managing applications. That's why we like it, and that's why we're working with them and contributing to the Kubernetes community. Now that you have these, VM, these containers and applications running inside of VMs, the value that we bring is all the value that we've added over the last 10 or 15 years with our ecosystem of services and solutions. Think about if you had an application that was containerized, it was a cloud-native application, and you wanted to vMotion it. Well, you couldn't do that on a bare metal server. You have to have VMs there. You have to have SDDC underneath. Think about if you wanted to do persistent storage with virtual SAN and replication. What if you wanted to set up firewall rules? What if you wanted? IP address management, all of those sets of tools, the isolation, the security, the compliance that VMs bring, and this ecosystem of tools and solutions around it, all of those are going to be there for containers as well. And we're going to work to make containers a first class citizen in our environment on our SDDC architecture. So again, SDDC is one platform for any application. Today, you can run standard enterprise applications and use VMware APIs to manage them. Or as Pat mentioned earlier and as you mentioned earlier, you can use OpenStack APIs to manage them. I want to remind people that containers are nothing new to VMware. Our Cloud Foundry PaaS layer has supported containers for over three years. In fact, we supported containers with something called Wharton which was our implementation of containers on top of Linux LXC. And Pivotal is currently in the process of moving to Docker. So they will support Dockers as a first class citizen in the PaaS layer. And what we're announcing today is that we're going to work with Pivotal, Google, and Docker to allow containers to run on top of SDDC with all the same sets of capabilities and integration that you have come to expect from VMware and VMs. So let's take a look at how this works as in a demo. Right. Here we are in the vCloud Automation Center that hopefully you're familiar with. And we have a developer that's requesting a cluster so he can work on Kubernetes. Let's take a look at that request. It's a multi-machine blueprint. Really what that means is there's three VMs here. There's a master scheduler Kubernetes node and two slave nodes. But there's nothing special. They're just VMs. Mm -hmm. And you can see the configuration. So let's go ahead and submit that. And that request has been submitted successfully. Let's switch over and take a look at what the developer sees once the IT uh, has provisioned the cluster. Oh, wow, a command prompt. Reminds me of my old, <laughs> good old days of, as a developer. Yes, it does. Yes, we did have command prompts back then. Back to the future. <laughs> Uh, so let's go ahead and type the Kubernetes command to see what pods are running here. Nothing, of course. It's a brand new environment that was just set up for us. There's nothing running. So let's go ahead. Again, the developer types in the Kubernetes command to bring down the application from the repository. Go ahead and execute that. And as that's going on, let's switch over to our console. This is the console that was developed for this Vulkan application that we're building. And all it does is it reports the services and the pods as they come up. And you can see that they're up and running with their own unique IP addresses, and the three services that we requested are there. Now, let's go back and see what happened to the developer. The command completed. There's three replicas running. And if we run the same command again to list the pods, you can see that the environment has three pods and three IP addresses. You might say that's pretty boring. Yes, and you'd it is. be right. Yes, it is. That is exactly the point. <laughs> this stuff already works on vSphere. It already works on vCloud Air because all it is is an environment for developers to do their work inside the VMs. The IT personnel get to keep their control and policy, and the developer gets to use the tools that they're familiar with to build the application. It all works together. That's great. So in vSphere, are we doing any particular enhancements for containers? Yeah, you mentioned, uh, uh, Kit mentioned earlier as he was up here when he mentioned Project Fargo. That is exactly the approach we're taking to Got make it. VMs faster, smaller, 
and um, smaller memory footprint and boot faster. So sub-second um, availability of VMs will make containers a lot more speedy on the VM environment. In some cases, even better in terms of efficiency than running on bare metal. Oh, so we are awesome. doing a lot of great work there with the team. That's great. Thanks, Ben. That was a great demo. So ever since we started vSphere, the mantra has been all applications. And that continues regardless of what the application architecture is. So you can see how we have a single platform that can effectively run your traditional and new applications. Not only run them, but provide the core set of infrastructure services, whether they are persistent services or networking, et cetera, and provide automated management and policy around it. That's the power of a single platform. All right. Oh, there you go. What is Here's this? another one. This is completely illogical. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you right, would think they on. could at least find costumes that fit us when they're going to do this, yes, right? Yes, that was made in several decades anyway, ago. Anyway, I believe. All right. <laughs> All right. Enough of that. So now let's look at the next layer up, management. So yesterday, Pat announced our vRealize suite. Now try saying that fast twice. <laughs> vRealize suite which is our comprehensive cloud management platform solution that combines cloud automation, cloud operations, and cloud business all together. Now, we have come a long way in our journey in the management space. We started with a set of point products. We turned them into functional groups. And now we are converting them into a suite of services. This set of services can manage your assets whether those assets are physical, virtual, or in the cloud. You could deploy vRealize Suite either on-premise, or you could use it as a service on vCloud Air. And it will manage not, the, not only the infrastructure, but it will address your traditional applications and your cloud-native applications. A very comprehensive platform. Yesterday, Bill announced the beta for the cloud automation as a service offering. And you can register for the beta on vCloud Air. Is it beta or beta? Beta. Beta, OK. Let's call it beta, better. All right. But the distinguishing aspect of vRealize and our management strategy is management by policy. All right? Now, policy is a very overused term. Yep. So to explain what policy really is, let me invite my chief policy officer now, <laughs> Ben, to show us how it works. I'm going to get a different paycheck for each of these titles you give me, right? Yes. OK, just check it. Uh, I'm not a you're responsibility. Right. <laughs> policy is an overused term, but the concept is really simple. What it means is you can take a set of business rules or compliance requirements and codify them in software so that the infrastructure and our software and technology can enforce it for you. And if it ever falls out of compliance, you can automatically remediate that, or at least warn the administrator if automatic remediation is not possible. I thought policy was how you tied an application to a network. You mean <laughs> it's much more than that? No, that's, that's a pretty narrow view if you just look at the network. Policy can actually be applied to storage, to networking, to security, to compute, to things like the cost of the infrastructure. And it can be pretty complex. You can have things like um, regulatory requirements saying that you can only run this application in a certain data center or a certain geo. Mm -hmm. So all of those can be specified through policy. So let me show you uh, what this looks like in a demo. Here we are back in the vCloud Automation Center. And it's great to see that we have within the last five minutes, apparently, all of a sudden gotten <laughs> containers, dockers, Hadoop. We've got Pivotal Cloud Foundry. We've got OpenStack, vCloud Air, all of them available to us in our vCloud Automation Center. But we're going to go look at this Vulkan uh, project that we're going to take into production. It's a standard three-tier enterprise application with an app tier, a database tier, and a web tier. And if we go and drill down into the web tier, and scroll down, you can see that it has a set of network policies and security policies associated with it. 
We're going to come back and describe these later, but I want to look at the storage policies right now. I see that there's disaster recovery to vCloud Air available as an option. I think that's a great idea for our application, so I'm going to request it by just clicking it. And let's look at the storage policies. I think I'll t pick the silver profile here, and we'll come back to that. Okay, let's go ahead and submit that. And now that it's successful, let's go and look at the vSphere web client and see what those policies were translated into in the, in the infrastructure. Let's look at that bronze, uh, sorry, the, the silver profile that we talked about earlier. If we drill into that, you will see that it's based on virtual SAN. Mm -hmm. And virtual yep. SAN is great because all of the storage is managed through policy, which means I don't have to worry about the low-level details of iSCSI and Fiber Channel and LUNs. What we've specified here is that we want our application to be able to be resilient to two simultaneous infrastructure failures. Now, that can be a server, that can be networking, that can be storage. It doesn't matter. Virtual SAN takes care of everything in the background, and if any of those components fails, it automatically remediates by copying the data or moving to another server. Right. So that's great. Let's hit OK there. I noticed that there's also a gold uh, profile here. Let's go and take a look at that. And as you can see, this is based on virtual volumes. Mm -hmm. Now, virtual volumes gives all the same capabilities that we have in virtual SAN in tem terms of policy-based management, but for external SAN and NAS arrays. And the data that's presented here and the options that are presented are based on the capabilities that that array presents to us. So we can see that we have compression, dedupe, flash cache. Those are great. If I ever want to use a better tier of storage, I can move my application to this tier. So go ahead and close that. And that's, that's the power of policy. By just changing the policy from silver to gold, automatically the data would get mi migrated from the vSAN to the vVol storage. Powerful. While we're here, I also want to point out, this is, by the way, our 6.0 vSphere web client, which we heard from our customers loud and clear that they were not happy with the performance and the usability of that client. So we've spent quite a bit of time significantly improving the performance and also improving the usability. The recent tasks list that you see at the bottom here is an example of that that was requested by customers. So we're working diligently on improving the usability and performance. Finally. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. All right, I like that applause so much that I'm going to stop talking about all the innovations and just talk about all the bugs we're fixing in the next <laughs> release. Oh. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's go back now and take a look at uh, those security and networking policies. If we go over to the infrastructure tab, you can see our three tiers here again. And let's go look at the web tier. What you see here are the types of protocols that we want to allow and the ports we want to use and the policies that we want to associate for the load balancer. So this tells us the different tiers and how they can communicate with each other. If you go to the security tab, you'll see that there's a number of security policies that were actually authored by our security team. So as an IT administrator, I don't even have to know what the details are. I know this is the web tier, and that says web policy, so I'm going to just assign the web security policy to it. And if you scroll down, I'll see that this, uh, based on the security settings, this is also PCI protected. Mm -hmm. So great, that's exactly what I need for my application. So let's go ahead and close that. And go over to the vSphere web client and see um, what happens with those policies in real life. This is another, by the way, usability improvement. You can get to the home button and see all of the top level menu items in the new vSphere web client for use, better usability. So if we go over and take a look at uh, the networking area, you can see the logical switches that were actually created and deployed as a result of the policy that I described earlier in VCAC. And if we go over to the NSX Service Composer, you can see the security groups that were also created as a result of that policy automatically. And if we click and look at the networking firewall rules, you can see that it has all of the same rules that we set up in our policy. So all that's of that the, with that one line? All of that with clicking on one policy, and Got it's it. automatically applied to the infrastructure and automatically travels with the application. So if the application moves, or changes, it's automatically remediated. Right. Really powerful. 
All right. You got to talk about secure micro. Oh, secure micro segmentation. I forgot. <laughs> so uh, let me describe what happened here with uh, networking. So as Pat mentioned yesterday, um, we have a crunchy exterior and gooey interior with the data centers. What that means is um, that you have a firewall protecting the entire data center, but if a piece of malware ever gets into the data center and breaks through that barrier, it has complete control. It can infect all of your VMs and all of your applications. This is what we call uncontrolled communication, right. and it's not really good. With the power of NSX, we can create micro-segmentation. Now, one example of that is no communication. I can set up my VM so none of them have access to any others. That's not very useful, but it is possible. Um, and it's very secure, but you can't get a lot of your work done. What we prefer is what's called control communication paths. So using NSX and through the policies that I showed you, you can set up the firewalls so only certain tiers or so only certain VMs can t uh, collaborate with each other and the rest of them are protected. And if a piece of malware ever comes in, we also have a model called control communication uh, paths with third-party context. That means we've been working with over 40 of our partners in the industry with their layer four to layer seven solutions, whether it's antivirus or IDS, IPS type solutions. They can give us hints about when they detect a piece of malware and we can automatically protect the VMs in that case. So with the combination of these, I think you can see the micro segmentation power of NSX through policy can get you exactly what you need in terms of security and control. That's very powerful and very unique. So that was a great explanation of policy. Policy is how the management layer and the infrastructure layer cooperate to enforce the business rules that need to control and constrain the application behavior. So what this does, though, is it allows for freedom for developers. On the one hand, you can be assured that you have governance and control in place for all of your applications, while at the same time enabling your developers to do their job, to be able to deploy applications with self-service, to be able to expand them in an elastic fashion, or to be accessed it in a programmatic fashion, et cetera, knowing that the infrastructure and management layers will cooperate to enforce the policies, regardless of what type of application. So this is a powerful capability that's unique to our management software. So we've gone on a rapid tour of the new developments in STDC. We started at the fundamental hardware layer. We talked about how hyperconverged infrastructure will fundamentally transform and simplify your data center infrastructure. OpenStack enabling you to do your work while enabling the developers and DevOps community to programmatically access your infrastructure. Single platform, as Ben talked about, for all applications, all tied together and controlled by our automation layer, specifically through policy. So this is the architecture for today and tomorrow. So now let's, let me step back a bit. If you think about the software-defined data center architecture, it is inevitable. You think about the largest data centers in the world, the largest web-scale companies in the world, the companies that are managing billions of dollars of revenue using this infrastructure. They're all running an infrastructure based on the STDC principles. They're not building an infrastructure based on HTDC. They have built an infrastructure very successfully using the STDC principles. What we have done, we have taken those same principles, we have adapted it and modified it and enhanced it so that it meets the needs and requirements of enterprises that have to grapple with today's applications and tomorrow's applications that have to grapple with security and policy while enabling developers to do their thing. That is why we believe the STDC 
is an inevitability. It is often said that the future is here. It is just not evenly distributed. Many of you have already taken the journey with SDDC. We congratulate you. For many of you that have not started yet, the time is now. We invite you to join Team STDC. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Raghu. That was excellent. Thanks. Great job. All right. Now I would like to welcome Simone Brunozzi, our Vice President and Chief Technologist for vCloud Air, who will talk about, to us about the hybrid cloud. Simone. Buongiorno. Buenos dias. No, no. Buongiorno in Italian. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Ah, guys, can we help him say it correctly? Can you help me, please? All together, buongiorno. When I say three, two, one, buongiorno. Buongiorno. Oh, that was good. That was All right. good. Now it's Excellent. nice. <laughs> What's with the funky pants and the coffee and the glasses? <laughs> Well, this is, first of all, it's an espresso. Ah, okay. And uh, Google Glass is because I'm keeping an eye on our data center. In fact, uh, let me show you what just happened on my way to the keynote. Okay. Let's uh, Google Glass play the video. So having I was, uh, as you see, doing something very important. Yes, having coffee. Well, in espresso. Very important, as I said. I was also looking at the VMworld app, which runs on vCloud Air. But at some point, I saw a notification that, uh, have, that uh, popped up on the corner, Ooh. at the right corner, capacity constraint. So this comes, of course, from VCOps. And this is an example of the type of visibility that you get from um, vRealize uh, Cloud Management Platform, or CMP. So um, of course, this is, uh, oh, thank you. This is uh, an example of what our engineers have been playing with. But I want to take this off. And this is not for you. I'm going to keep this. <laughs> okay. okay. And then, of course, I want to put on my real glasses so I can at least see the audience. We don't and want then, you to fall off the stage. No, 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 no. Don't worry. And then, oh, wow, that's nice. And then I want to show you actually what's real. I want to give you some, some examples. So let me show you vCenter Operations Manager. You can see the capacity constraints that uh, we just saw on our Google Glass. And in this case, memory is not enough. So this is good because we can proactively react and uh, do something to fix issues that we have. So if you look at the overall health status of our system, we can see that on the right side, our networking is perfect. It's green. And on the left side, vCloud Air is also green. Everything is healthy. So to fix the issue, we can simply copy and extend our workloads from on-premises to the cloud. And to do this, of course, I'm going to show you uh, something. But before we go there, let's also understand the cost implications of what we're going to do. So if you go to IT Business Management Suite, we can also see the exact costs of running our applications in-house or in the cloud. And in the case of vCloud Air, this includes everything, security, firewalls, load balancers, you name it. Wow. So we go with vCloud Air, of course. This is course. the platform of choice for us. And um, we go back to our uh, vSphere web client, and we're going to do something there. So let me show you the uh, first step we have to take. So in this case, we picked a multi-tier application, Microsoft Link, which is a platform for unified communications uh, between coworkers, for example. And we decide to extend the network. And in this case, we're going to use the vCloud connector, the new version, which allows you to do this full layer two network extension into, in this case, vCloud Air. So we right click on the application. We go to the vCloud Air actions and extend network. And here you can see the cloud type, the name, the uh, destination. In this case, it's going to be Las Vegas. And the uplink network, which is the network that we're going to use uh, for this extended network to connect to the internet. We go next. Summary is good. We click Finish. And as you saw, in just three clicks, we were able to very quickly extend the network. Now, if we go back to the uh, hybrid cloud um, um, panel and we take a look at the um, we look for the Microsoft Link application in, in that, uh, in that um, cloud environment there, we can see that it's there. So we go to vCloud Air Actions. We do copy. 
And this is, of course, the operation in which we move those workloads into the cloud. So vCloud Air is our target. We also go into uh, select a virtual data center or a VDC among the ones that we have available. Then we go on next. Here we can select the storage profile. And remember, this is chat and gossip between coworkers, critical. Otherwise, people will not even go to work. So we're going to select a gold profile in this case. And we go on, next. Uh, we make sure that we power on the VM after deployment. Next, summer is good. And again, in just a few clicks and just a few seconds, finish. And now, the application has been moved to the cloud. And in but fact, we can verify this by going back to the hybrid cloud. Uh, this is a plugin for vSphere. And uh, we look at the applications in this list of applications that are running in the cloud. We look for a link, and we see that it's there running in this cloud instance. Yeah, but Simone, we've been able to do this for a while now. What's different? What's yes, new? you're right, you're right. In fact, the main difference here is that we extended a full layer two network. So let me show you. Let's go back to um, our in-house infrastructure under networking and security, our NSX dashboard. And we can see that there are two firewall rules here. One that allows our um, front end to connect to the internet, and one that allows this application to connect back to the SQL server that hosts our data. So if we go to the hybrid uh, cloud environment instead, our vCloud Air web portal, we can click on the gateway, and we can see that those two same exact firewall rules have been ported together with the application into the cloud. And if later on we're going to move it back, those two rules are going to follow the application wherever it goes. This wow. is why this is it's just very... like the policy demo I did five minutes ago. Yes. Going all the way out to the cloud. Yes, very exactly. seamless and consistent. Exactly. Love so it. let me give you an overview. Let me show you a diagram in which I'm showing you what we just did, what we just saw. We have our data center on the left. Apps are running there. Through NSX, we can extend uh, those applications and the policy and the governance of those applications into the cloud, and of course, in this case, into vCloud Air. And we can always move it back if we want to do this. So this is the power of uh, hybrid cloud. In fact, let me go to the next slide. Uh, we use this word hybridity uh, to mean that you can seamlessly and securely extend your applications from your data center to the cloud and vice versa. And you can bring the same security and the same management tools that you are used to. So it's uh, really uh, very easy for people to do this. In fact, uh, it is so easy that essentially hardware disappears. And I know every time I say hardware disappears, Ben suspiciously looks at the Italians in the room. No, <laughs> not all the Italians, just look at me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so of course, by saying hardware disappears, we mean that you don't have to worry about hardware anymore, because you can run your apps in-house, in the cloud, same management tools, same security. You should just forget about whatever hardware you're using at that moment. And of course, uh, you know, the hybrid cloud allows you to increase the agility, the time to market of your applications. One uh, easy way to get started uh, is, uh, of course, the DR as a service or disaster recovery as a service. And in fact, you heard yesterday from MIT that uh, MIT Media Lab and other teams there are very happy using this service. And we can do this in just a few clicks. Can you imagine this, doing a DR in just a few clicks? Yeah, well, it can't be that easy. I mean, well, DR is complicated. Let right? me show you. Let me show okay. you. Let's, uh, let's okay. go to the demo now. Prove me wrong. So again, we are under, in, in our vSphere web client. Uh, we have a, uh, an application that we want to protect, Project Vulkan. It's very important for us. So we right click on it. And we go to the vSphere replication actions, and we configure replication. You're all familiar with vSphere replication. It's built at the hypervisor level, so it allows us to uh, use the efficiency of those network operations. But in this case, there is a new option there, replicate to a cloud provider. And this is what it gets interesting. We go next. Of course, uh, uh, we already connected our DR virtual data center, so we can just select it and go next. We can uh, select uh, different types of storage options. And in this case, we can also use replication seeds. Essentially, if you FedEx your data to us, we're going to use it as a base to then start uh, building Delta updates to it. And then we click on Next. Being uh, this Microsoft link, so um, a Windows application, we can also take advantage of Shadow Copy Service. I don't know if you know anything about yeah, it. Yeah, this is one of the things that my team built when I was at Microsoft. Oh, Glad to see nice. it here. <laughs> that's very nice. I, I didn't know that until you know, we practiced this. <laughs> so let's go next. <laughs> Yeah, it's not the first time we do this. Right? <laughs> so we go next. Uh, let's look at the RPO, Recovering Point Objective. 
uh, this is, of course, a very important parameter for any DR. And in this case, given that we're using uh, our technology, we can go down to 15 minutes. And in, of course, uh, one hour is more than enough for this project, so we're going to leave it to one hour. We go next, and then uh, we can finish. The summary looks good. And now the application is protected. From this point, we can easily fail over into the cloud from the vSphere uh, web client, or if our infrastructure is down, even directly from the vCloud Air web portal. And of course, we can pre-network the DR environment, so when it comes up, it's already connected to, to our environment. Excellent. So did oh. you like it? <laughs> so let's uh, now take a look at the big picture here. Let's go back to the slides. And I want to thank Mike Roy for his help with the demos. So vCloud Air is the true hybrid cloud. It allows you to seamlessly extend your data center and your applications into the cloud and back without changing anything. Same management tools, same security. And in fact, it brings the data center to the cloud and the cloud to the data center. It goes both ways. And of course, uh, what about support calls? What happens well, if there is any issue? You know, if anything goes wrong, there's one support call, one number to call, regardless of where the problem is, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, and you can call VMware for support. That's, that's a true enterprise hybrid cloud. Yes, I agree. This is a true enterprise cloud. So let me give you some uh, takeaways before I leave the stage. Of course, you know that vCloud Air is uh, the hybrid cloud solution that we offer to our customers. I, of course, suggest you to sign up for the beta or beta, as vFather says, my, uh, our manager, for vCloud Air on demand. It has been already very successful so far. Of course, you can visit the service provider pavilion to take a look at vCloud Air and play with the service and also maybe try to do the same things that, I, that we demoed for you. And of course, you can sign up today. And you have to. I think it's a great service. Excellent. Ben, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Simone. This is for you. Thank you. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Ciao. All right. Um, so I hope you saw with what Simone showed you that we're really bringing you the power of N in this case as well. With on-prem and off-prem in the cloud or in the data center, you can take advantage of